So welcome to this final Sunday in July as we gather in the season of Pentecost. We are going to have a sabbatical again this year during August. And so we will resume after the Labor Day weekend on September the 12th. We hope we will come together for the first time in the church service and in the sanctuary as a community of faith again. That's our hope. We'll see how August goes. But during August, as last year, we invited you to go to the map that uh, will be posted on the newsletter and on our website. And there's over 400 United Churches across Canada that you can drop into their worship services. And we invite you to have a look, to worship with other communities, and to observe what's going on. And if there's good ideas, bring it back to us. So we hope that this experience will broaden our worship experience and uh, diversify our perspectives. So we thank you for your ongoing support and we really look forward to coming together in September as we emerge again from these challenging times and enter into the fall with new enthusiasm for how we can worship as your people gathered together. We respectfully acknowledge the southern watershed of Manadawitsagayagan, Spirit Lake, Georgian Bay and Wayasayagnang, Shining Lake, Simcoe, and centrally Lake Kuchiching waters and lands that have historically sustained the lives of Wendat and Anishinaabe and Anishinaabeg, including the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and centrally Rama First Nation the keepers of the Manjikining fishing weirs. These sacred lands and waterways are recognized in the Robinson-Huron Treaty, Williams Treaties, and Jay Collins Land Purchase. Recognizing all nations gathered and living here today from across Turtle Island, including Haudenosaunee, Métis, and Inuit peoples.
So we come into this time of worship in this Pentecost season, the season when spirit is alive in and through us, inviting us into the spirit of love, inviting us into solidarity with sisters and brothers around the world as we seek God's kingdom, the common good on earth. The theme for today lifts up the moral ambiguities of what it means to be alive and to seek beauty, to seek love, but also to face the challenges of injustice and wrongdoing in the world today. So we come into this time of worship, opening ourselves to the spirit of divine goodness that invites us to be together and to seek love in the world. Let us worship together. So we enter into this sweet hour of prayer. I don't think I'll pray for an hour, but uh, we get the sentiment that it's good to pray together, that it is part of our gathering, even in this virtual way, that we offer good energy towards love and justice making, and that as a community of faith, our prayers are held in this way. So let's pray together. We pray with a spirit of thankfulness, thankfulness for the freedom to make choices, 
to choose to be people of love, to choose to be peacemakers, to choose to reconcile and seek a new day when things have been wronged, when we have been wronged, when the world seems against us and the wrongs seem to multiply around us. We are called again and again to a spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness and transformation of seeking a new way of being together in the world with each other and with our planetary home. We pray this day for those who are feeling challenged, for those who face injustice, who live in places of violence and hurt. We pray for those who are abused in their relationships. We pray for those who need financial support and health care concerns and the many ways that we feel challenged in our day-to-day -day living. May our prayers hold and sustain all in need this day. May we celebrate the gifts of being alive in the beauty of this summertime, in the beauty of friends and family, in the beauty of coming together again as we challenge this pandemic and act responsibly to come together and to do our public services and respond responsibly. So we pray for our community of faith. We pray that we may look after each other and do your will in the world. We pray that we come into this time of Sabbath, that it may be a time of rest and refreshing ourselves in this summer season. We look forward to the season of the fall coming together again to be your people and to appreciate what it means to be engaged in this community and in this world. So we ask that our prayers surround each one of us with goodness, offer us love and encouragement, offer us the hope that love is ever-present, ever-nurturing, ever-comforting to each one of us. Amen. Oh. 
When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall taken from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house, and that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, she sent and told David, I am pregnant. David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord for the people of God. During the month of July, I have been using the stories about King David to talk about how they relate to our faith today. 
the images of these stories about the ark and about what we believe, about place, about where the ark resides and what that means about place for us today. And this week, the story of David and Bathsheba and a moral quandary uh, in it. So we have to remember that like any of the biblical stories, they come to us at a symbolic level that they have been told down through the generations and have a moral meaning to them. They are presented in a symbolic level. They, they have uh, varieties of metaphors and language that invite different responses. So in the David story, there's an arc to it. We have him as shepherd fighting Goliath, becoming the king, bringing the ark to Jerusalem. And then in this, power goes to his head and we begin to see the slide downwards, the, the falling of David, falling into uh, abuse and injustice and how that declines in who he is for the people. When we hear this story that Carolyn read today about David and Bathsheba, it's a hard story to hear. It's a hard story because of its obvious moral injustice that is so easy to see. We see David taking advantage of Bathsheba, she being an innocent woman and being called by the king had no choice. And then David uh, attempting to cover up the situation by inviting Uriah to eat and drink and hoping that he will sleep with his wife and cover up his uh, David making Bathsheba pregnant. You can see the, the time sequences are out here and so the symbolism of the story and then, uh, in essence, orchestrating the murder of Uriah. So it is a moral story that's hard for us to hear. It's a story like the Me Too stories that we have been faced with, where we see the abuse of power and the exploitation of women who are faced with men who have power over them. And we have been rightly outraged by that injustice. And we have seen how women have been silenced and haven't been hurt. When I was working on thinking about this sermon last Saturday, in the Globe and Mail there was a large expose by one of the residential school survivors who had been talking about his experience, <clears throat> excuse me, in the residential school, about the abuse that he had suffered, about the horror as he heard the priest's robes shuffling down the hall, coming to take him away and to abuse him and then forcing him to repent and ask for forgiveness for nothing that he had done. He had tried to escape and the police hadn't believed him. He had gone home at breaks and his mother hadn't believed him and sent him back into this. For decades now, he has been trying to have his story heard. And so he is thankful that after all this time, his story is being heard and people are appreciating this abuse of power that happened in this context. We see it in the Black Lives Matter, the abuse of excess power by the police. We have forums happening in this week with Jewish people identifying racism and uh, Muslim folks identifying racism towards their community. So we appreciate increasingly in this society how this extreme of abuse is present and is there. And we're outraged by it. And we wonder how it can happen and how it can be present to us, how we didn't notice it. 
and it's a challenge to us. But we only have to think back and to learn from history. We, we hear, and it's well documented, that the Nazis in Germany, they began their, um, their persecution of the Jews in a small way. And when society didn't respond, they began to escalate it. And it began to escalate, and people didn't respond and didn't respond until the lie had become so big and so outrageous that uh, they, it was ignored by the broader society. And so we see this the lie perpetrated in these kinds of unjust ways. We live in an era of the big lie, and we, we see its implications and its challenges. We read in the newspaper of how the big lie works and how authoritarian uh, governments and how abuse happens. And so we are called again and again to expose the big lie. And as people of faith, we hear our testaments of how to counter the big lie, that the values that are uh, talked about here stand out in contrast. And we, we know them, don't we? The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you do do wrong, ask for forgiveness and seek to reconcile. Be humble, be generous, be gracious. These are the gifts that we are endowed with and the ability to stand against evil by pursuing these things. But we also recognize that even though we stand between good and evil on this side or good on this side, whichever, that life is complicated and there's moral ambiguity and there's a, a mix in there of gray area that we swim in and that we live in. I spent 20 years at the university doing a doctorate in ethics and teaching ethics about how to unpack the layers of ethical conversations, how to look at it from a contextual angle and people's experience and what are the facts and what do our traditions and our culture say that we need to do this kind of ethical clarification so that we can understand that there are differing ways and that people don't enter into uh, moral ambiguity in uh, unthinking ways, that there are things that influence us and challenge us. And so we need to do this work. That's part of our calling, not just to preach one side against the other. So we take a case like the residential schools and clearly we can see now that they were part of a colonial understanding of the world, a world that created uh, one uh, culture, our dominant culture, uh, over another culture and belittled it and humiliated it and then tried to wipe it out in order that we imagined in that kind of colonial thinking that we were helping the indigenous people. We recognize the wrong-headedness of this now. But then we put ourselves into this story and we recognize it's a story about our missionaries. It's a story uh, that we supported a hundred years ago our missionaries, both at home and overseas, were taking a gospel of Christ's love and salvation that was filled with these cultural biases, this colonial perspective. I've always had a huge appreciation for missionaries, and uh, even in my early days, I imagined being a missionary. I started to do the work around it and have respected many missionaries. But we recognize that the kind of missionary work that our church did in other parts of the world had this kind of Christocentric and this kind of colonial attitude mixed in with the good works. 
and that this was attitude was mixed in as well with the residential schools and our attempt to help the indigenous people from what we now see as a wrong-headed perspective. So many of our, in our tradition, we have changed. Uh, by the 1960s, we had understood that this was a wrong approach to our missionary work, and we changed our strategies towards partnerships with people overseas. And we began to unravel the understanding around residential schools and to begin to work with indigenous community to ask for forgiveness. By the mid-80s, we had formally apologized and were spending millions of dollars in healing and reparation and asking for forgiveness for the systemic injustices that we had been part of. And we recognize in the mix of this that there were perpetrators of injustice and that these perpetrators needed to face the uh, injustice and the cruelty that they exercised. And uh, we engaged in legal <clears throat> systems of, of naming and calling out that injustice. And so we are challenged. So we, we live amidst the ambiguities of this and the differing perspectives, and we have to continually work in these gray areas to discern right from wrong and how we can move forward. Often the David and Bathsheba story gets translated around sexuality, that somehow our sexuality is bad, that Bathsheba lured David, or David couldn't control his urges, and we create a sexual understanding of it that gives a wrong impression. We know that our sexuality is a gift of the divine. It's a beautiful spiritual offering to us as human beings, and we, we live in that wonder of physical expression and appreciation. Yet, when it is, comes into a power dynamic and into abuse and into one person having power over another, then it changes the dynamic of its goodness and challenges it with an unjust side and a side that is manipulative. And so we again discern these differences. And... When I think about this story, let me just go down here and get my notes. When I think about this story of David and Bathsheba, I immediately think about the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah. I'm a big Leonard Cohen fan, and Hallelujah is one of those beautiful testaments of challenging uh, the ambiguities of love and power and how it comes to us. And the word hallelujah, as uh, was so beautifully sung earlier, raises uh, within, within us a powerful sentiment of, of appreciation and praise. And so Cohen does a, an amazing job in this song of lifting up even amidst a morally ambiguous story of David and Bathsheba, he turns it around. I had hoped to play it, but because of copyright laws, we're, we're not allowed to play this in our service, but Google it and find it on YouTube. It's beautifully done by Leonard Cohen, his, his uh, song Hallelujah. So his words, now I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor falls, the major lifts, the baffled king composing hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. 
her beauty and the moonlight overthrew her. She tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. And from your lips she drew the hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. These words where it turns David's urges into his power dynamic and Bathsheba turns it around. She ties him to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne and cut your hair. This beautiful symbolism of lifting up that power dynamic and turning it on its head. So hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us live into the praise of what is good. Let us be a faith community together, living into what is right, our care for others, into humility, into justice, into love making. Hallelujah.
So we have worshiped together. We have struggled amidst the complexities and ambiguities of our moral lives. We recognize in this that the divine calling to all of us is one towards justice, towards love, towards holding us in the beauty and wonder of this creation. So we invite Creator's blessing. We walk with friend Jesus through the challenges of life. And we are blessed and held by the spirit of love that holds us and challenges us towards peace in the world. May this be so. Amen.